Uh, I'm with CDT. I direct our work uh, in Europe based in Brussels. So this week is Transatlantic Week. So a number of members of the European Parliament uh, are in Washington DC this week for meetings with Congress, the administration, with agencies and uh, industry and civil society. And um, it's an annual event, uh, but I think it probably has special significance this year given the uncertainties uh, that fill the news cycles uh, these days. So there's no better time than now to reinforce and renew and deepen uh, transatlantic uh, relationships. So it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, uh, MEPs tonight from the uh, Parliament Civil Liberties uh, Committee. Um, and we have uh, the chair of the committee, Claude Moraes, who is joining us on the panel tonight. And we're honored uh, to have him. Um, many, many of you know CDT for our work in Washington, so I'll just say a few words about what we do in Europe. Uh, so our work is to, our job is to find uh, good responses to difficult questions and challenges raised by digital uh, innovation. So we want to make sure that these technologies uh, move society forward and help address all the challenges and problems that we have. But we also want to make sure that they uh, safeguard uh, human rights, that they bolster uh, free expression and privacy, uh, notably. And so uh, Europeans confront these questions just as uh, uh, US uh, citizens do. And we have sometimes difficult policy outcomes. Europe has a very uh, busy policy agenda in the digital space, uh, data protection, copyright, platform regulation, law enforcement, access to data, encryption, etc. So in Europe, CDT engages in all of these questions. Uh, we try to provide credible, uh, reliable, fact-based input and to help find good solutions to all of these questions. So our goal in Europe, as in the US, is to keep uh, uh, the internet open, innovative and free, European style. So with that, I want to uh, welcome uh, our big thinkers to the stage. We have Nula from CDT. We have uh, Claude, Eli from R Street, and I leave you to have a successful debate. Thank you very much. Oh, they're good. They each have one. Terrific. I'm so glad because I didn't really want to share. <laughs> Um, I'm Nula O'Connor. I'm the president and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology. And you have just heard from Jens, who heads Brussels. Um, we are tremendously honored, first of all, to welcome the VBA committee and the members of the delegation. And may I call you Claude? You may. My dear friend Claude, who I've met many times at this point. Um, thank you to the delegation, to the, the folks on staff who helped put this event together. Thank you to our friends at R Street, especially Eli and his team, for being such great partners on this event and many, many other policy initiatives in this area. Um, we think that this dialogue is tremendously important. We think our European relationships in the US and the EU uh, transatlantic are incredibly important. I get to sit between these two, not only a reflection of our politics, but also that I hold both EU and US passports, so I get to go both ways. Um, and uh, I'm not, not going to filibuster anymore. We've seen just in the news in the last week in the United States how important our cybersecurity, our technology is to the furtherance of democracy. And I think we're going to have a a lively, if not um, very brief conversation, and then open up to questions. And so I'll start with this. The team at CDT has heard me say, the democracy is in peril. And I don't just mean in the United States, I mean the constructs of democracy worldwide. Um, if democracy is going to survive and thrive in the digital age, I'm gonna start with Claude and then I'll turn to Eli. What are the biggest challenges that we must address as institutions of government, as institutions of the private sector, or as individuals. What are we going to do to fix it? Well, yeah. Just what? Uh, ah, first we start with... It's working? No, it's not. It's working. Yes, it's working. It is working? No, just my voice is soft. Yeah. Um, just uh, trust. Trust um, is the most important thing. And um, 
I think I think one of the one of the issues for the European Parliament for the European Union is that people wonder why our committee is called Justice and Home Affairs and Civil Liberties um, deals with so much. Uh, it deals with so much because I can see your eyes are going to glaze in a minute, but um, they're but, ahead of you on their drinks my, club. It's my it's Nula told me to have a drink to make me less boring, but I haven't. <laughs> so you are going to have to suffer the consequences. That's tough. That's that's how it's going to be. Um, but what happened after the Lisbon Treaty was that nobody figured out that it was about trust and privacy, and the roots of trust and privacy are everything, uh, because it's about consumer confidence. It's about the very basis of, of everything that we do. And when it came to the trust in elections, it should have been no surprise to anyone uh, that we would get to this position, that we would get to a position where uh, we spoke about the integrity of elections, uh, we spoke about a global crisis, where we reached such a position that you would have a, have a, a platform that so many people were on. I have Indian relatives and they tell me that there are people in India who will maybe go hungry at night but they will have a cheap smartphone and they will be on Facebook um, and Modi will be using Facebook. This is the global situation that we are in and this is the reality of today. Um, before I say any more I, want to, I also want to say that um, the MEPs who have come to this, uh, this transatlantic week um, are now working at this point on so many critical issues. When we saw Mark Zuckerberg coming before the European Parliament, um, things are moving so fast that it isn't just a question of you know, GDPR being the issue for Facebook, it was e-privacy, um, the cutting edge of, uh, of, of legislation. Today we, had to, we were talking about artificial intelligence. So I just want to quickly introduce uh, my colleagues, all of whom are working on these files. Also because I want to implicate them in my uh, answers. And if I get anything wrong or I'm excessively boring, all of them are implicated. Um, so Birgit Sippel, who is, she's already half drunk here on the thing. But, um, yeah, because she, she's not responding. Birgit is Birgit, apart from drinking wine or beer, sorry, beer, she's a beer fiend, um, is, is also, sorry, this is going to be corrected very quickly. She is also the e-privacy rapporteur. Her status has been restored. Um, uh, Mikhail Boni is working on artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things. Um, also Cornelia Ernst, the coordinator in the GUE group, Natalie Griesbeck on the Special Committee on Terrorism. I wish I hadn't started this now, because if I miss anyone, I am dead. Um, who else is here? No one else here? OK, so all the special ones came tonight. Um, OK, anyone else who's too shy to be implicated? No, that's it for, OK, nice one came. That's good, thank you, colleagues. But yeah, so to answer your question quickly, privacy became the root of everything we did. And this was, this was the key. As a result, um, our humble committee now is a legislative engine uh, in the Parliament and the European Union. It really dwarfs what other committees do, and that includes in the economic sphere, in the internal market sphere, and that's because this has become so critical. And if people don't think it is critical to ensure that when somebody votes in any Western country and they know that their vote actually counts and is not corrupted, uh, then that is, that is really now the most critical thing. And just finally, we came from a, a meeting of all the NGOs, the, the, the EPIC meeting just now, um, and people were asking about whistleblower protection, uh, they were asking about all of these issues which are connected. Um, and I think we're at a, a really interesting time in these issues where we're talking about the rule of law, and we're talking about digital, and I think it's a very exciting time. Well, thank you for putting in a plug for CDT's work on election cybersecurity, by the way. We're doing a big fundraising event around that this month. Look online. But Eli, do you want to take issue with the premise, or what do you think? Is the democracy in peril here in the United States or elsewhere? I would say that the democracy in many ways is in peril, uh, although I would say that the digital future has only a, a relatively small part in that. 
In many ways, I agree with what Claude has said, and certainly you make a number of excellent points. Uh, it, it is absolutely true that trust, honesty, underlie a free society, a democratic society, a liberal society. All, all that said, I, I would argue that something underlies that as well, which is a basis in an empirical fact and truth and, and, and facts. The ability to agree on the facts to agree on what can be empirically shown, and perhaps even more importantly, the ability to tell the difference between opinion and fact. There are many efforts coming from both left and right that confuse these things. Without a fundamental basis in empirical verifiable reality, without a fundamental basis in the facts that we can agree on, it becomes very hard to have a democratic debate or any debate that's of use. I think that's tremendously accurate and it reflects the work we're doing with the Knight Foundation and, and others on trust, media, and the democracy. And the question we pose that I'm not going to pose to both of you is, if there is disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, first of all, should we be calling it propaganda if it's government sponsored, but what is the role of government in combating that or elevating fact or truth? What is the role of a platform um, in ferreting out or moderating. Some of our research at CDT shows the limitations, for example, of automated content moderation uh, and that AI is not the silver bullet that one might hope. Um, and then what is what is on the individual or on other societal organizations like education and other, other ways to solve the problem of people believing things that are simply not true? It is certainly a theme we see around the world, not only in the US and the EU. Yeah. Well, first of all, I agree that AI is not the silver bullet, um, but we can't just limit our exploration of what technology can do. So that's the first thing. So it's a dual thing. So in the work that we're doing now in the, the Parliament and the European Union, we have to test the limits of what we can do on platforms because this has got out of control. And we now see um, people who will take all of their news from the platforms, um, and we have to understand just how much we can deal with that. But I, I really believe there are limitations. Secondly, we have to understand that as with anything, copyright or anyth anything else, um, we, are, we always go back to first principles, which is journalistic integrity, truth and trust. And, you know, at the end of the day, that will be the hard work that has to be done to correct fake news and false news. And we, we have populist movements now which, which are using um, fake news. They're elevating it to iconic status. But at the end of the day, uh, they're blurring the distinction between technology um, and what is good old fashioned propaganda and lying. It was done in the 1920s. It's being done now. So, so we as active citizens have to understand where we sit. We're sitting in a, in a world of the use of propaganda, the populist uh, movements, um, and just take first principles first, and then understand the limitations of technology. But we don't give up on AI and machine to machine and what we can do, but we're going to have to have human beings involved in this. And that means not letting Facebook off the hook and the other social platforms off the hook. So I was going to start actually with the easy one, which is privacy, because I do think free expression, no, thanks somebody for laughing at that. Um, I do think that our legal constructs around freedom of expression are, may be an area of some discord across the Atlantic. One of my European colleagues, not a cdt -er, said to me not long ago, you Americans, you love your First Amendment the way you love your Second Amendment, right? So not a popular sentiment among some of us. But, but Eli, what do you think? Do you think this is a solvable issue? Do you think the onus is on the platforms, the individual, the government? How do we fix this? Well, I'll start by saying there are a few things I love more than the Second Amendment, and one of those is indeed the First Amendment. So, Case in point. All, all that said, uh, I agree that there is an impossibility of solving this with algorithms. I agree that first principles are of utmost importance. And for that reason, I think that the time-tested reality of efforts to control the truth, to monitor the truth, have shown time and again 
directed efforts by central authorities, including private ones, to try to determine what is true, what is not, have, uh, have almost always and everywhere failed and made things worse. The solution to bad speech, to disreputable speech, to problematic speech, is not censorship, but more speech and better speech. The best way to do that is with a wide open market of ideas and a wide open market of commerce. That, historically, in the United States and elsewhere, is how we have moved forward. That is what has worked. The alternatives, time and again, have not been as successful as working towards freedom and free expression. That needs to be the basis, and that's the first principle. Now, the responsibility of platforms. The responsibility of platforms, primarily, in the case of those that are stockholder-owned, stockholder as most of the major ones are, is to their stockholders, of course. Now, a platform known for being disreputable, for spreading fake, for spreading fake news, uh, might win as an entertainment platform, probably is not going to be the most successful in the long run. It is in the market interest of platforms to do it. And Nola, you mentioned a number of disciplinary mechanisms, but the most important of those, the most critical of those, is the market itself and the ability of market mechanisms, both of ideas and of commerce, to discipline the proceedings. That is likely to be the way to do it. As such, we need strong protections, both for speech itself and for intermediary liability. Uh, CDA 230 is one of the most powerful tools for protecting free expression in the history of the United States. That's the type of thing we need more of. So I guess I get to be in the middle and say I feel very strongly both ways. Uh, CDT bows to none in our Section 230 advocacy and our First Amendment belief system, but I also recognize that market forces are not always ones that elevate the voices of the disaffected, of the less represented, and, and that there is a, what I would say, at least a moral or social or ethical responsibility of actors in the ecosystem to think about the impact. Just as we had companies in the industrial age thinking or, or not thinking about their environmental impact and thus having to clean up rivers and, and, and mountains and others in the United States and elsewhere, there is an environmental impact to the use of data and the dissemination of information in the digital age that I think has not been fully scoped out yet, but we're going to leave it there and move on to even more fun with elections. So the news just in the United States in the last week obviously shows the importance of cybersecurity hygiene for all of us working in areas of sensitive data and sensitive communications. Um, we've seen new evidence in the UK of the vote um, leave uh, campaign breaking some election laws. Um, what do we do and what steps does Europe take? What steps does the United States take uh, in preparing for the next election and preparing for political communications um, in strengthening and shoring up not only our cybersecurity but how we talk to each other in our political sphere? Well, first of all, just to say what, what is a free and open market in media, the European Union, of course, has many different uh, models. And I just want to just, just say this very quickly in the context of Brexit, which also had the vote leave um, vote. We also had 35 years of monopoly power in our press, the highest press readership per head of population of any Western country, uh, just overtook, I think, from India, United Kingdom. And that's the Murdoch Press Associated Press. And the point about this is monopoly ownership. And this is not a proliferation of ownership. And it had one systematic direction, which was the hatred of the European Union. And that's fine, except that most titles had this in mind. And of course, this has had an effect over the last three decades. Now, I mention this because while this exists, the broadcasting media is independent. But the broadcasting media, and this is very important, the broadcasting media tends to have now a 24-hour uh, focus. And, uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is in a digital age where you have the multiple platforms, um, you, you need to then focus on the press all the time. So they're continually reviewing the newspapers for added value 
from broadcasting. And this now is why the BBC, which was an extraordinarily um, uh, balanced brand, is now seen to be pro-Brexit, which is quite extraordinary to people. But this is how this is happening. And the reason I mention it is because when you come then to Cambridge Analytica and vote leave, and we, of course, have had three Facebook hearings. So this is not about us just saying this is happening. This is the evidence that we're gathering from our own hearings, um, is that the, the, the continuum from this um, is to understand that this is not about the naive assumption that you shift thousands or hundreds of thousands of votes by people looking at fake news um, on Facebook. What you are shifting is small numbers of highly vulnerable votes um, just on the back of quite a, a, a kind of modified 30-year denigration of um, readership of, I think you'll all be familiar now with the Sun newspaper after Trump left the United Kingdom. So you know the Sun now. The Sun News the world, the highest read per capita newspapers in the world, still today. Um, and of course, the other titles, Murdoch owned or associated, newspaper owned. So there, there's quite a strategic view of what has happened. So I think the, the problem is that this next phase matters. And we had the Electoral Commission. We had, of course, Elizabeth Denham, the Information Commissioner now fining Facebook. These are not imaginary steps. These are real steps. Um, you know, if you were committing a crime and you had the evidentiary um, kind of line, this is it. Um, and it's deeply worrying because um, we, we now know what the manipulation was. And, and, it, and it matters for, for those who are highly suggestible. And the conflation always, of course, and this is very important, the conflation with Brexit was always with immigration and migration. Um, and it was a deliberate conflation. It sold newspapers too. Um, and I think, I think the key point is that this is a dangerous model for most countries because it can destroy political parties. Um, you saw the Dutch Labour Party. Uh, it can now destroy centre-right parties, the EPP, uh, will now face this. Um, having had to compete all over Europe. Sorry to talk about Europe for a minute. Um, having to compete with lots of uh, far-right parties in the centre um, and to be in coalition. And you saw this with the left. Um, and this is the problem that we're going to have in the European Union. So this really matters. It really matters to get to the root um, of what happened with Cambridge Analytica. It matters to understand what happened with the apps. Um, and what Mark Zuckerberg is or is not doing in taking down these apps. Um, so getting a better understanding of all of this really matters for our elections. Um, and then to get to the root of, of what the Russians are doing, how they are interfering, they, they, they are interfering is a given, but how they are doing it and how strategic it is and who they are targeting and when um, is, is extremely important. And I would just encourage what we did in the parliament, not the first hearing, because that was terrible. Um, <laughs> sorry, is that official? I'm just looking at it. <laughs> official. Well, it was officially terrible. Um, but obviously he came, which is better than the House of Commons. He didn't come to the House of Commons. That's on tape. Um, but he came and it was awful. But we should have had a more forensic one-on-one -on -one and all the rest of it. But our committee should have done it. It should have been a more committee style thing. But we didn't give up. We then had three hearings where we tried to do our work and spoke to the people who mattered and tried to get to it. The reason is because you need to build a basis um, on which you can you can have the investigation. So this is, this is critical. I would really commend everyone the coverage in the New York Times and the Washington Post this weekend of the hacking indictments because an important lesson learned is uh, that our election cybersecurity experts will tell you it's not just that the hackers will attack and provide false information or that they will literally change votes but one salient point that was in the the coverage and is now public is that the illinois database was hacked to the tune of i think half a million people's identities were stolen or 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 um, changed that means lines at polls that means people will not be able to vote. That means there is not only 
fear and disinformation and doubt in the ecosystem, but that literally people who show up to vote will be denied or delayed and give up and go home. And so there are lots of ways to disrupt the election. And Eli made very good points about the content and knowledge and fact. There are many, many ways to disrupt an election from a technology point. You want to say something on that topic? Uh, obviously, the idea of election disruption by the Russians, Russian spying, Russian hacking, is beyond dispute. And the idea of our president denying it was incredibly foolish. All that said, I question the underlying premise that this is, or even can properly be, a role of the government to police fact, to police truth, to police the media. The fundamental problem with medias with media consolidation is not the existence of consolidation, not rightfully gained market power, but rather the continuance of that and the inability to enter it. One reason why um, all of the large internet companies are American, why all the large intermediaries are American, is the existence of things like CDA 230. That's what works, freedom. That's what can move things forward. That is ultimately the solution to the great bulk of these problems. Now, it's true that many people will be misled. That's deeply unfortunate. But the fact is that who watches the watchers? Trying to prevent people from being misled, establishing a truth place, which ultimately, if it is to be part of the state, will have the power to use violence to enforce its view of the truth. It is itself not a good idea. It's not likely to work. And it's not the way that we're going to get there. The way to do this in the long run is there are any number of law enforcement mechanisms, any number of foreign policy mechanisms that must be, that must be used. At the same time, fundamentally, and this is where I agree very deeply with you, Claude, First principles are what matters. And the first principles that work best are those of liberal democracy. So I know it's warm in here and we want to get to some questions from the audience. I have one more discussion point for us and my favorite topic, individual data privacy. So we've known each other a while and we've worked on things from Safe Harbor to the directive to now GDPR. Um, I know there's been recent commentary on Privacy Shield where is this all going from a US EU perspective? Where do you want it to go? Well, after today, I want to sort of forget it and have a drink, but because yeah. um, we just had a you sort of mauling from uh, the State Department. This is being filmed, though, right? Isn't it? mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. ch Sorry, we've had Chatham House rules all day, nope, and I'm used sorry, to that. Nope. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. OK, so um, yeah, Privacy Shield. Um, we, we're doing our job on Privacy Shield. We're a European Parliament. Um, like Congress, except slightly better. Um, <laughs> With no ability to propose legislation by itself. <laughs> yeah, sorry. OK, I really walked into that, sorry. Uh, what I meant by better was just more coherent sometimes. So um, we, uh, our job is to look at Privacy Shield and see, is it corporate? We've been through Safe Harbor. Is it going to work? What are the problems? And there have been great improvements in Privacy Shield. And we acknowledge that today. And um, the um, you know the reaction from the State Department was slightly different. Um, but the point is that we have to do our job. We have to point out exactly where the flaws are, and that, that's the point. The issue the issue is that um, you can't have major international transfers of data without ensuring. First, that it's court proof. First, that people's data is safe. Um, knowing that we've been through this process before, and that clearly was not the case. The infrastructure is important, um, uh, but that is only one thing, and then there are the other safeguards. So, this is a process, and that is where democracies work. And it's important for us uh, to be to be in control of that. So, th this is all I can say. Uh, but I think um, that's why we're here. By the way, it's also that kind of whole situation of us being here every year, doing our job, um, and yeah, 
what more can I say? I don't want to bore yeah. you with privacy yeah, issues. That was a lovely and diplomatic that. answer. I expected nothing less. And we have great days ahead of us for US federal omnibus privacy legislation. Count on it. We'll be talking about that again soon. But I want to open it up to questions. If anyone has, do you want to say anything about Privacy Shield? I, I would just add that I would agree that the US has a tremendous amount to learn from the EU and that there are many aspects of GDPR and other uh, European uh, privacy regulations that are enormously important. For starters, the mere existence of uniform regulation. There are, however, problematic aspects, things like the right to be forgotten. And many aspects of EU law are, even if they are good, are simply incompatible with American common law and cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, carried out in the United States. They'd be unconstitutional. I, I don't think these were the issues on Privacy Shield, frankly. No. I mean, I think the issues, the issues no, on Privacy definitely. Shield were far more practical, yeah. infrastructure-based, uh, uh, and, and, and this is where we have to seek yeah. adequacies. No, those are, those oh, are the places adequacy. where there is an enormous, where there is an enormous ability to work together. I mean, 70 to 80 percent of what is being done ought to be adopted by the U.S. Yeah, but now, now I would not like GDPR to be caricatured by Americans after even a Republican acknowledge that you need to modernize your data protection law I, I just, following Facebook. I, I just said that. Yeah, good. We have just questions. Check. And we're going to start with one there and then one there. Sure. Kurt Levy, uh, Committee for Justice. I wanted to get back to the previous topic of, of uh, interfering in the election. You know, pretty much everyone agrees that there was, um, you know, to one degree or another, interference by, by the Russians. But I don't really hear any discussion of sort of what the standard should be of what's permissible and what's not. Um, you know, so what do we do? Oops. Sorry. Um, you know, and I'm, again, the hacking stuff is illegal under American law. Some of the Facebook stuff, it's harder to, to make the case that it's illegal. But I guess I'm not really even talking about a legal standard. I'm talking about more moral standard. and in a world in which there's constantly espionage between the major powers and, um, you know, Russians, Chinese, other countries hack our computers, we hack their computers, um, you know, the Russians interfere in our election, we meddle in one way or another in, you know, politics and elections around the world, you know, everything from criticizing other governments, including at election time, um, to, you know, Voice of America, to, um, um, you know, sometimes making clear our position on elections like Brexit to things that probably only the CIA knows about. What should, what should the standard be? And I really just hear no, um, no discussion of that. Or, or do we want to be, in a sense, is it okay to be hypocritical? Maybe, maybe the answer is that, at least for some people, that it's sort of our nuclear policy. We can have nuclear weapons and you can't. Too bad. Breaking in to me is pretty much breaking in, whether it happened digitally or in the Watergate. Well, what about the fact that we have a you know, okay for us to say, look, we're going to do it. Eli, would you want to go first? Sure. It's the responsibility of every country, uh, including ones we don't like, to try to obstruct foreign espionage. Uh, it's perfectly legitimate for people to carry out. Um, certainly sort of open public diplomacy and at a free press must allow as well for a sort of gray area of public diplomacy uh things that may not be totally truthful but have to be allowed like say rk uh we have the same obligation as any other country uh certainly if we um engage in espionage it's not wrong for other countries to try to catch us and other countries have the ability to do it and we should try to catch them uh, there is, I think, a relatively clear line between espionage activities, which break the law, and white and gray public diplomacy. Uh, I am, I think that the simple amendment has to tolerate a high level of what's essentially gray public diplomacy. Which is less than Yeah, yeah, no, those are, those things, I think, basically in a free society have to be tolerated and could be driven out by by more and better speech. We can't uh, it, sort of drop the First Amendment because somebody is getting some money from a foreign country. Uh, I don't know how you start. I, I, I don't can, know how you start yeah. drawing lines there. Could, could I answer this very quickly? Um, the 
question of scale and calibrating what it is and is not acceptable. I know you're talking about espionage, things that have happened for years, is to understand that this must be decided by you, by us. So you have to have a democratic process that is open and as transparent as possible and let people decide. So people will decide that we didn't interfere in Putin's election, sorry, his coronation or whatever it was. Um, <laughs> You know, you know, this is exactly what we should do. So you have inquiries, democratic inquiries, you have a free press, um, that is um, regulation because you won't want one person to own everything. I mean, you know, it's not Orson Welles and Citizen Kane, you know what I'm saying? So you have a free press, you have a decision by all of us as to what is acceptable. It's a question of scale, calibrating it. So then you would discover uh, that criticizing Putin um, is a bit different from leave EU, Cambridge Analytica, and interfering in elections, but also the fear that entire nations, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Italy now, will have because they're putting in critical infrastructure to prevent interference in their general elections. In fact, even in regional elections, I know this is happening in the United Kingdom, uh, intelligence activity going on to protect your own critical infrastructure, calibration and getting that out into the public domain. There is no need not to be transparent about this anymore. This is a new phase. So, of course, espionage has happened before, uh, but we're not in the Cold War anymore. So this is a question now of understanding it. That doesn't mean that we have to be naive about whether we hack other people. The question is, can we have an election which we believe our vote is not now manipulated? That is a new phase. And I think the only way to do this is to make it open, which is why after our first Facebook inquiry, we just keep going. Uh, and, and as I say, it might be boring, uh, but when our information commissioner quietly and modestly fined Facebook as much as she could, half a million pounds, which is like the petty cash, register for Facebook and Silicon Valley or whatever, but it was something because it indicated what is not acceptable. And this is what, this is the journey that we have to make. And then it'll be clear. Okay, and, and then we're gonna have to move on to the next question, thank um, you so much. And the, the Irish government just today announced an inquiry into the effect of social media on the elections as a societal threat. And so there are governments looking at this issue all over the world. We've got one more question and then we're gonna go back to drinking. Or not. <laughs> I think we can hear you, Jim. Of course, it's the number one question for the UK. They thought they could walk into a security treaty. That was the easy one for the UK and the European Union. And they found that it's even harder now than um, the trade agreement. Why? Because we have to pursue an adequacy agreement. Now that is going to be extremely difficult because we have what is the legal base for our access to SIS2? What is our legal base to access for all of these things? Why? Because there is a study of how we're using these databases. We're copying the databases. You could say any country would do that when they're leaving. Well, that's the kind of thing that is happening. United Kingdom's in five eyes. Of course, these are all the issues that are now going to happen. And that's the problem. That is the problem. It's not going to be easy just to be a good neighbor. 
The issue is where is our data going to go? Where is the United Kingdom's data going to go? So this shows, in answer to your question, the new paradigm that we're in. Otherwise, it would have been friendly, good neighbors, protecting the area of proximity, security treaty, our assets being used. You know, it would have been James Bond, Bletchley Park, everything's great, five eyes, make it seven eyes, fine. But it's not gonna be like that because data is a much more complex issue. Um, and you need a legal base and you need trust that all of these things will be okay. And I mean, I hope you, you get some security arrangement that is safe and watertight between UK and the European Union. But, but these questions will come in and the context will now matter. We are so over time. I want to ask each of you uh, to take your question maybe later uh, privately. And again, thank all of the MEPs who are here. Thank our partners at R Street and Eli. And thank my dear friend Claude for spending time with us this evening. And now we're going to get you that glass of wine. Thank you all for being here. And please enjoy your evening. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine.